Um, thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is um, Dr. Kirkland um, from Rochester. He's going to tell us about aging adipose tissue and cellular senescence. Thank you very much for listening to what I'm about to say, and I wanted to thank Aubrey very much for inviting me here. Uh, beautiful place. I'm going to speak a bit about um, fat tissue aging and cellular senescence and begin to um, give an inkling of what some therapeutic uh, options might be with respect to this. So as you're probably all aware, fat is the largest um, organ in humans, in most humans. It varies, of course, from individual to individual, but females, uh, with a body mass index over 35, which is a high proportion of people in uh, North America and increasingly in Europe, and males with a body mass index of over 45 are more than half fat tissue. So a woman walking around with a BMI of 35 is more than half fat tissue. Uh, fat tissue also turns over throughout life. Um, on average, subcutaneous fat cells turn over once every 10 years, but this can be a lot faster. We recently published with Mike Jensen an observation that uh, in 20-year-old uh, subjects given high-fat uh, feeding for a couple of months in hospital with biopsies before and after the period of high-fat feeding, that new fat cells uh, formed in dramatic numbers with just uh, an increase in weight of, a, of a three or four kilograms. So there's a very large progenitor pool in fat tissue. The tissue has to be very plastic and respond to uh, changes in nutrient intake. And it's probably the largest progenitor pool in the body, given that uh, anywhere from 15 to 50 percent of cells in fat tissue are fat cell progenitors. So it, it turns over large progenitor pool, large organ. Fat tissue has also become increasingly uh, positioned at a nexus between um, what happens with um, aging, health span, uh, metabolic state. So it's been found, for example, near Barzil, I found that uh, removing visceral fat surgically from uh, rodents will increase maximum lifespan. Ron Kahn found in the FIRCO, the fat-specific um, insulin receptor knockout mice, that maximum lifespan was increased. It's been noticed that, um, uh, as I'll show you a bit more about, that uh, decreases in growth hormone and IGF-1 signaling are associated with uh, decreases in age-related fat redistribution and some of the changes in fat tissue function that occur, and also an increase in maximum lifespan. It's even been noted in invertebrates that many of the effects of, uh, for example, the DAF mutations on lifespan are centered on the fat-like organ in C. elegans that surrounds the bowel. Uh, fat tissue appears to be the main source of circulating inflammatory cytokines in old age. Nathan mentioned earlier that a key component of the frailty syndrome in humans is increases in, I, in IL-6 and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. It appears that fat tissue accounts for the bulk of uh, production of these inflammatory cytokines with aging and in frailty. Obesity, on the other hand, is associated with a sort of semi-accelerated uh, aging phenotype with uh, earlier appearance of age-related diseases, including diabetes, atherosclerosis, a variety of cancers, dementia. Uh, people with a BMI above uh, 40 or so have 10-year earlier appearance of Alzheimer's disease than age-matched populations of lower BMI. It's, of course, uh, associated with a decrease in lifespan, partly because of these diseases, and an increase in chronic inflammation that resembles the frailty syndrome. So with increasing age, we tend to have less fat where it should be and more fat where it shouldn't be. Uh, these changes begin to become very evident in humans after the age of 40 or so. There's a, uh, a loss of um, subcutaneous fat uh, that occurs, and then later on a gain in intra-abdominal fat and ultimately ectopic redistribution of fat from traditional fat depots into places like bone marrow, liver, and muscle. Uh, fat tissue loss tends to be very stereotypic. It uh, occurs in subcutaneous tissues starting peripherally and moves centrally. Uh, the first fat depot that which tends to decline with increasing age is the retroorbital depot. And then in the 50s and 60s, you begin to lose fat over the dorsal of the hands, uh, the uh, distal parts of the legs, you get spindly legs, and eventually subcutaneous fat tissue starts to get lost uh, uh, more proximally 
concomitant in the early 70s with um, uh, quite substantial increases in intra-abdominal compared to subcutaneous fat. So I'll go into some of the mechanisms through which the loss of fat tissue occurs on the one hand from subcutaneous regions, which are normally protective, and a gain in fat in ectopic locations like uh, liver and muscle where, uh, and uh, visceral fat where uh, damage tends to occur or be associated with fat change. So I mentioned before that um, fat tissue um, contains a large pool of progenitors. These are shown in the, um, these small cells. Uh, in younger animals, this shows what happens in rats. Um, there's an increase in fat mass through middle age, and then into old age, there's a decrease in fat mass, particularly subcutaneous fat mass. Uh, this, is not, this is associated with an increase throughout life in fat cell number in many depots, or at least stability in others. So the decrease in fat mass that occurs in advanced old age is related to a decrease in fat cell size, not number, because numbers can actually go up. Uh, fat cell progenitor numbers also increase throughout the lifespan, and the ratio of fat cell progenitors to mature fat cells increases throughout the lifespan, such that in very old animals there are roughly two progenitors per fat cell, and the converse is the case in younger animals. So fat tissue develops, as I mentioned, throughout life uh, from progenitors, uh, starting off with uh, mesenchymal uh, progenitors, which are largely resident within different fat depots, although there is a small circulating pool that can, in an age, gender, and depot-specific manner, contribute to um, fat cell enlargement. But most of the progenitors are resident in the depots that they eventually turn into fat cells in. So th through a process of determination, these mesenchymal progenitors uh, involving the WIMP, GATA notch, BMP, and uh, a PPAR um, gamma upstream regulator uh, become determined uh, preadipocytes which can develop into fat cells. This process appears to be highly reversible. Uh, there are two types of preadipocytes, cells that are more or less committed to become fat cells. There's a slowly replicating subtype that is uh, poorly capable of turning into fat cells. In other words, it's resistant to both the dipogenesis and replication. And there's a more rapidly replicating subtype that's capable of uh, becoming uh, fat cells. These two subtypes appear to be uh, interconvertible. This can happen very quickly, as you can show in serial subcloning experiments. And this appears to be true of all mesenchymal cell types, that there are two types of progenitors um, that uh, can switch into each other. Perhaps this acts as a reserve pool so that if uh, their, their influence is causing differentiation, you're left with some progenitors that are undifferentiated after that exposure. Um, through a process of differentiation, preadipocytes uh, can become fat cells. The main driver of this is IGF-1. Uh, Preadipocytes do not have insulin receptors. They develop insulin receptors as they differentiate. Uh, glucocorticoids can promote the process um, and perhaps to some degree initiate it. A burst of cyclic AMP generation will help to promote the process. This possibly occurs through the beta adrenergic nervous system and also partly through uh, tissue adenosine and other mediators. Lipid ligands can uh, help to initiate and certainly promote the process, and these act largely through. Uh, uh, nuclear um, transcription factor uh, that, are, that are receptors for lipids like uh, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, but there are other things like AP2 that um, fatty acids bind to that promote adipogenesis and affect it in different ways. Fat cells can be gotten rid of through a process that involves a combination of apoptosis and necrosis and some inflammation. Uh, Preadipocytes are hard to get rid of. Um, they're quite resistant to apoptosis. Uh, probably to allow the tissue to regenerate after injury, and they're susceptible to, to senescence, which I'll get into. Um, I mentioned before that uh, the fat tissue progenitors uh, tend to be resident within tissues, uh, and you find that um, the um, cell dynamic properties of fat cell progenitors from different fat depots within the same subjects um, are very distinct. Uh, so the, the cell dynamic processes I've indicated in red all differ in human subjects if you take uh, fat tissue from uh, different regions. Uh, Preadipocytes from different depots in humans look different. So this shows six passage primary subcutaneous preadipocytes from a subject, mesenteric cells from the same subject, and the mental cells. They, they look different. Um, this appears to be an inherent property of the cells because if you transduce single preadipocytes from the same subject, 
with uh, uh, human telomere reverse transcriptase and passage them for 40 population doublings originating from single cells, you find that these depot-specific uh, patterns of morphology persist. Uh, the main groups of genes that differ amongst preadipocytes from different fat depots are developmental regulators. So if you do um, uh, GO analysis, for example, you find developmental regulators come to the top of the list. Uh, the types of genes that differ are, are lineage determination genes and um, uh, developmental uh, uh, specification genes like homeotic genes. Um, you, this shows what uh, subcutaneous compared to amenal preadipocytes with some of the developmental regulators that, that differ the most amongst uh, fat depots from the same subjects. And you can see that these patterns are quite distinct. Um, if you make um, telomerized clones from single cells, passage them 40 times, and look at those same developmental regulators and compare subcutaneous to amenal cells, you get the same pattern. So these differences are inherent. Uh, you find they don't differ too much, they differ a bit between females, males, obese, and lean. Um, but they're, they're, they're generally pretty uh, resilient. In other words, um, preadipocytes from different fat depots are distinct cell subtypes, and they probably contribute to regional differences in fat tissue function. With aging, I've indicated, the, again, the cell dynamic properties that vary amongst depots. I don't have time to go into a lot of the primary data. We've uh, summarized some of it in a recent review. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, cellular senescence in, different, in, in fat tissue in different depots with aging and adipogenesis. We'll start with adipogenesis. So if you take uh, preadipocytes from young compared to middle-aged or old uh, rats in parallel and expose them to differentiation-inducing conditions, uh, looking at primary cultures that have been passaged a few times where you take steps to purify the cultures and get rid of potentially contaminating cell types, you find that capacity for adipogenesis declines with progressing age, uh, particularly in extra abdominal depots like the perirenal depot or the subcutaneous depots. Same thing is true in humans. You find the capacity of these cells to turn into um, fat cells in response to adipogenic media when you culture cells in parallel from younger compared to older individuals declines with increasing chronological age. If uh, this is, uh, these age-related changes are fat depot dependent, this shows what happens in perirenal depots in uh, rats looking at single cells, uh, that uh, clones derive from single cells at, at adipogenic capacity. You can see there's a progressive age-related decline from young age to uh, advanced old age, but you find much less of a change with age in epididymal depots, which in general are more resistant to adipogenesis throughout the lifespan. Adipogenesis is driven by um, a number of uh, transcriptional regulatory uh, pathways, uh, but the main one probably involves uh, CBP beta being switched on, which in turn switches on PPAR gamma, uh, which when bound to a fatty acid ligand switches itself on, turns on CBP alpha, and drives uh, adipogenesis. CBP alpha, once it's switched on, tends to switch on CB PPAR gamma and itself. These two transcription factors have to turn on and remain on for a fat cell to remain fully functional, insulin responsive, and to uh, uh, be able to accumulate lipid properly. So once these are on, they have to stay on for a fat cell to work properly. Uh, what you find with increasing age, if you take primary preadipocytes from different aged animals and culture them in uh, parallel and uh, look at switching on of these uh, transcriptional regulators, is that there's a decline with increasing age in both isoforms of PPAR gamma and also in uh, CBP alpha expression. If you restore CBP alpha to um, preadipocytes from old animals, you uh, largely restore capacity for lipid accumulation. To some extent, you improve adipogenesis in um, uh, preadipocytes from old animals if you restore PPAR gamma expression and expose the cells to fatty acids, but not entirely because there are some coactivators of um, PPAR gamma who's, that, that also change with aging that modulate this. This shows CBP beta being switched on early into adipogenesis within minutes after induction of adipogenesis. Uh, it goes up at the RNA level in the same way in old animals as in young animals. So the block that occurs in adipogenesis is somewhere between CBP beta and PPAR gamma. And I don't have time to go into it, but we found that there are a number of redundant pathways that appear to act at this point to, uh, that contribute to the uh, age-related uh, reduction in capacity to go from CBP beta transcription to PPAR gamma activity. Uh, many of these pathways uh, involved um, uh, stress responsive elements 
And some of them, uh, the starting point involves uh, TNF alpha and IL-6 production going up, uh, driving some of these uh, uh, mechanisms. So if you look at um, preadipocytes from uh, young compared to middle-aged and old animals, you find uh, depot-related differences. This shows uh, PCR analysis, confirmatory PCR analyses of some of the things that change the most on uh, genome-wide expression arrays. Um, you find that there are big differences amongst depots in age-related patterns and changes in gene expression. And you find that the things that tend to go up in the subcutaneous depots or extra abdominal depots, like the perirenal depot, are inflammatory mediators, uh, matrix remodeling proteins, and uh, um, chemokines. Uh, IL-6, for example, uh, goes up. TNF uh, production goes up per preadipocyte quite dramatically. Preadipocytes are very closely related to macrophages. They do virtually everything a macrophage will do. Uh, they'll, they're motile. They'll engulf bacteria. Um, they produce most of the uh, cytokines and chemokines that a macrophage will. The only thing that you can really distinguish a preadipocyte from a macrophage with is F480 or EMR1. Uh, because virtually every marker that a preadipocyte, that a macrophage expresses, a preadipocyte is quite capable of expressing, like CD11 or CD68. So um, preadipocytes from young animals don't produce too much TNF-alpha, but old, from old animals, they express about as much TNF-alpha and secrete it, this is secreted TNF-alpha, as an M1 macrophage. So they become very pro-inflammatory. If you block TNF-alpha production by preadipocytes from older animals, you get some restoration, but not complete, uh, of adipogenesis. Uh, TNF-alpha is very anti-adipogenic. It inhibits PPAR gamma directly and through. Uh, it inhibits insulin signaling, of course, and, and also causes lipolysis. Um, if you treat preadipocytes um, um, from uh, young animals with TNF-alpha, you uh, get uh, as with macrophages, uh, an induction of inflammatory uh, cytokines, chemokines, uh, and you get switching on of uh, P16 and uh, other mediators that ultimately result in cellular senescence occurring. So TNF-alpha treatment of preadipocytes will induce um, uh, cellular senescence or uh, with IL-6. Um, this shows uh, a, a, an IL-6 dose response curve with respect to senescence-associated beta-galactosidase activity. So uh, if you serially passage preadipocytes, radiate them, do whatever, you can get uh, senescent cells uh, forming that um, also have uh, a DNA remodeling occurring. As I mentioned, preadipocytes are very abundant cells. Uh, they acquire a pro-inflammatory phenotype as they become senescent, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Um, in older individuals, up to 10 or 15 percent of preadipocytes can be uh, senescent in some depots. It, the uh, abundance of senescent preadipocytes is quite highly fat depot dependent. And these cells produce um, uh, inflammatory cytokines that will in turn induce senescence in adjacent cells. Uh, so uh, we feel that this is one of the, and I don't have time to go into it, but when you, when you, when you eliminate senescent cells, you eliminate a lot of the pro-inflammatory phenotype of uh, fat tissue with aging. So we feel that uh, accumulation of senescent preadipocytes is at least one of the things which can drive fat tissue uh, dysfunction uh, with increasing age. If you look in uh, fat tissue from um, young compared to older uh, animals you find, uh, or humans, you find increasing abundance of senescent cells. They follow a linear pattern along blood vessels, so endothelial cells and preadipocytes become senescent. Preadipocytes tend to be clustered along uh, blood vessels. If you culture preadipocytes from young compared to older uh, uh, rats or humans in primary culture, you find an increased abundance of senescent-associated beta-galactosidase positive cells. You find the same, this just shows it numerically, you find the same thing with gamma H2AX or other markers of senescence, P16 and so forth. When we did proteomic studies looking at the secretory phenotype of serially passage radiated or primary uh, cultured from different chronologically aged uh, human subjects uh, and looked at secreted protein profiles, we find that the uh, main groups of subcategories of uh, proteins that are um, over-secreted by senescent preadipocytes include the ones that I showed you in the primary cultures. So there are things like uh, TNF-alpha, IL-6, and other inflammatory cytokines. Uh, chemokines like MCP1, RANTES, and RARES2, and uh, ECM modifiers, various MMPs, MMP3 and 12 uh, particularly. 
So I mentioned earlier that IGF is important in driving um, adipogenesis. Uh, it also drives pre site replication, differentiation, as I mentioned, and cellular senescence. So there appear to be switching mechanisms. I don't have time to go into it again, but there are beta integrin <coughs> pathways that appear to switch within cells that will change a cell's susceptibility to IGF-1 from a replicative response to an adipogenesis response. And we don't know what the switch is for cellular senescence, but uh, there are at least three pathways through which IGF-1 will drive cellular senescence in these cells. If you, um, uh, wh when you look at long-lived um, animal models, you find that there's a delay in uh, accumulation of senescent cells in fat tissue. So this shows what happens in Ames compared to, Ames dwarf compared to uh, older uh, wild-type animals. You get much more cellular senescence in subcutaneous fat tissue of the wild-type compared to the Ames animals. Uh, the Ames animals also have a delay in loss of adipogenesis compared to wild-type animals. Same is true, and a fat redistribution. I mentioned to you before that you lose subcutaneous fat and gain intra-abdominal fat. That kind of change in extra to intra-peritoneal um, fat ratio is delayed in AIMS compared to wild-type animals. Same is true of snell dwarfs. This shows accumulation of senescent cells along blood vessels in wild types compared to snell dwarfs. Um, and growth hormone receptor knockout animals. Uh, the same, uh, you, you find that um, uh, fat redistribution is delayed in snell dwarfs, uh, and um, uh, you also find in uh, IGF-1 receptor heterozygous uh, knockout animals that uh, uh, cellular senescence is delayed in subcutaneous uh, tissues. Um, again, in the wild-type animals, you can see senescent cells along blood vessels. You don't see it in the... Uh, IGF-1 receptor heterozygous knockouts. In intra-abdominal fat, you see le much less accumulation of senescent cells with aging than you do in um, subcutaneous and extra-abdominal regions. Uh, fat redistribution is delayed in the IGF-1 receptor heterozygous uh, knockout animals as well. Um, I mentioned uh, a minute ago that cellular senescence varies amongst depots. I also mentioned in the, one of the initial slides that obesity resembles a state which is something like accelerated aging in some respects. One of the things that occurs in obesity is that there's a lot of preadipocyte replication, particularly in subcutaneous depots, much less in intra-abdominal depots. Uh, telomeres are, um, you know, uh, the equivalent of eight population doubling shorter in um, uh, women who have a BMI of 40 than age-matched individuals with a BMI of 25, and you find accumulation of senescent cells in subcutaneous uh, depots in obese individuals compared to lean individuals. Here I'm showing within an obese individual uh, subcutaneous um, uh, uh, cellular senescence, uh, at least as evident by uh, SA beta gal, uh, compared to the mental depot where you don't find the same kind of accumulation of senescent cells. These cells are incidentally resistant to replication. Uh, you, their response in obesity is to become larger rather than for the preadipocytes to divide, and you don't find that telomeres are much shorter in a mental tissue uh, in obese compared to lean individuals in the same way that you do with subcutaneous depots. So you can see that senescent cells accumulate in subcutaneous fat in these individuals, but not so much in the mental fat. And this appears partly to be driven by differences in responsiveness to IGF-1. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into all of the detail about it, but subcutaneous fat is a lot more IGF-1 responsive than a mental fat. It turns out that this is related to serine phosphorylation of IRS-1, uh, a mediator of um, IGF-1 signaling. IGF-1 receptor tyrosine phosphorylation is the same in subcutaneous as in a mental fat, but um, IRS-1 serine phosphorylation, which downregulates um, uh, IRS-1 activity and transcription, is greater in a mental depots, accounting for uh, a decrease in uh, IGF-1 signaling and perhaps contributing to the delay in cellular senescence that you see in intradermal fat, perhaps contributing to the redistribution that you see with aging with initial loss of subcutaneous fat before you lose a metal fat. So in summary so far, fat cell progenitor replication and adipogenesis decline and stress responses are activated with aging. The extent of this varies amongst fat depots. Senescent preadipocytes contribute to the age-related fat tissue pro-inflammatory secretory state and impaired adipogenesis. This can spread from cell to cell and inhibit adipogenesis. And lifespan extending growth hormone, growth hormone and IGF-1 uh, pathway mutations delay progenitor dysfunction in cellular senescence, especially in the more IGF-1 responsive subcutaneous fat. 
Um, we've become interested in uh, removing senescent cells from fat tissue and looking at the responses to that, and also in inhibiting the senescent-associated secretory phenotype in um, uh, uh, um, fat tissue. We've been mainly, um, to do the latter, we've been using JAK inhibitors, which inhibit both growth hormone and IL-6 signaling. And uh, again, I don't have time to go into it, but you find quite dramatic declines in accumulation of senescent cells in, in circulating inflammatory cytokines and in other uh, uh, responses of these uh, cells with those uh, agents in our early studies. So our current model is that um, cellular senescence is at least one process that can drive some of the changes that occur in fat tissue uh, function with aging, uh, partly through the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which, um, drive, which can contribute to an increase in lipolysis and impairment in adipogenesis and, and decreases in uh, insulin signaling. I should mention that um, IRS-1 serine phosphorylation is largely driven by TNF and other inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the senescence-associated secretory phenotype can uh, promote inflammation uh, together with decreased insulin signaling, which is normally anti-inflammatory. Um, you get increased um, circulating free fatty acids because of decreased capacity to store fatty acids in subcutaneous fat tissue, as occurs in obesity, lipodystrophies. Uh, this appears to occur with aging. This can contribute to lipotoxicity by having lipotoxic fatty acids stored in tissues outside fat tissue, because normally fat tissue is able to detoxify these things and store them away as uh, neutral uh, triglycerides and protect the body from uh, damaging effects of um, highly reactive free fatty acids. And it turns out that these free fatty acids will also uh, drive inflammation. And paradoxically, in older individuals um, where uh, preadipocyte function is disrupted already, especially by inflammatory cytokines, these free fatty acids will um, induce inflammation in preadipocytes and even kill preadipocytes. So this is our, our sort of working model at the moment. As I mentioned, we're interested in intervening here, which we're in the process of doing, and also at the level of the senescent associated uh, secretory phenotype. And so far, results appear to be promising. And I'll just conclude by thanking the people working in uh, um, my, my laboratory um, uh, and um, uh, many other people um, working around Mayo and elsewhere. I think Nathan should have been on here. He gave the first talk, but he has, I have to put his name on here. And I wanted to thank our um, uh, funding organizations. Thank you very much. So you're, you're finding in obese individuals that the level of senescent cells is actually higher in sub-Q fat than in the visceral fat. Yes. And the story you get from most people in terms of uh, where all the inflammatory factors are coming from in obesity is it's the visceral depot. Yes. So That's what we find, too. Oh, so the, the bulk, irrespective of the senescence finding of the inflammatory uh, factors is still coming from the visceral fat. It's just this is an additional problem that you see once you see the Right. Skin. In humans, as you're probably aware, intra-abdominal fat is 3% of your fat tissue. Yeah. It's, it's very small. Um, we find that um, probably related to these developmental genes and processes that I mentioned earlier, that um, preadipocytes from visceral regions are resistant to um, adipogenesis, and they're also much more pro-inflammatory. So if you look at secreted protein profiles from lean young individuals uh, at a metal compared to subcutaneous cells, you find a lot more production of pro-inflammatory mediators by the intra-abdominal cells, but they're not senescent. It seems to be some developmental process which is making them more pro-inflammatory. With aging, we and other groups have found that you don't get a, a fur, much further increase in the already pro-inflammatory state of intra-abdominal fat. What you get is an increase in the pro-inflammatory state of subcutaneous fat with increasing age, concomitant with a decrease in subcutaneous fat. So that eventually, in very old individuals, the pro-inflammatory state of subcutaneous fat comes to resemble that of um, intra-abdominal fat in younger or older individuals. A question about the role of bacteria in enteric bacteria in these depots. Do we have any information on germ-free uh, mice and their uh, depots as a function of age? Um, I'm not aware of that. Someone may have some information about it, but I, I don't know. That. One more question because we are sure. already covered. 
Sure, sure. Um, so mesenchymal stem cells are uh, affected by IL-6 production in that they proliferate more and they maintain their stemness. Would the pro-inflammatory state of senescent cells be linked somehow to trying to maintain homeostasis in the stem cell pools? Yeah, we just got a grant to look at that, so oh. we're just beginning that process. <laughs> thank you. Four-year grant is going to ask. I'll tell you about it in four years. Uh, I'd just like to thank the speakers from the first session. Um, I think we need to be back here at quarter past, which gives about 10 minutes for coffee. <laughs>